It was a case that gripped the Bay Area a decade ago, and now the most unbelievable story behind the kidnapping of Denise Huskins has been turned into a new Netflix three-part docuseries. American Nightmare chronicles what happened after Denise's boyfriend called police in March of 2015, saying an intruder wearing a wetsuit broke into his Vallejo home, tied him up, drugged him, and abducted Huskins. From the start, police were skeptical of Aaron Quinn's story and pressured him to confess to killing his girlfriend. But then suddenly Denise turned up alive, seemingly unharmed, but described being held captive and raped. Investigators were still suspicious of the couple and in an astonishing twist, publicly accused them of carrying out a hoax. Huskins and Quinn were treated as criminal suspects while the real kidnapper would emerge in the strangest of ways soon after. With me today is journalist Henry Lee, who is featured in this docuseries. He covered the case extensively and, as you know from the doc, was brought into the folds of the case, much to his own surprise. Spoiler alert, guys. Go watch the series, then listen to this podcast. Once you see it, you'll realize there are many unanswered questions, and Henry helps us break down all of them. Henry, thank you so much for joining me today on Misunderstood. Glad to be here, Rachel. Thank you. Okay, so everyone is talking about this docu-series. People cannot get enough of it. And obviously, when people have seen it, they are just blown away. People cannot get over the anger, the anxiety they went through. Um, There are so many questions to be answered. So I'm so happy that you're here because you are the perfect person to answer all of them. I want to get into first, just let's like succinctly talk about what the case was and no one better again than you to kind of wrap this all up in a bow. There was a man named Aaron Quinn in Vallejo, California, who uh, was invaded. His girlfriend, Denise Huskins, was with him and... Essentially, they believe that a group of guys came in wetsuits and told them that, uh, you know, they're not here to rob them, but they covered their eyes with goggles, put music through headphones, put red tape all over. They said they have cameras all over this uh, house and said uh, eventually Denise was kidnapped and Aaron had a quandary. Do you call 911 immediately like he was told not to do or do you listen to this? stranger and say okay i'm not going to call 911 i'm tied up got zip ties you know he waited a number of hours before calling the police and it went downhill from there because all the details were so far fetched that the police had a big uh problem with his story that he made it all up and uh, essentially uh, she was later released near her parents home 400 miles away and that added to the suspicion that the police had about the couple They initially accused Aaron of murdering her. And then when she showed up alive, they accused this couple of making it all up. And it was just completely bizarre, far-fetched. And the public was just on this roller coaster with the police. They didn't know what to believe. And essentially, the couple said uh, that they were accused, or rather the police accused the couple of making it all up. And that they were out there for publicity, that it just didn't happen. And so they were branded liars on national TV. Okay, that's a great uh, that is a great rendition of what happened. All right, so the 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 documentary starts with this nine one one call, which I will admit sounds suspicious. He's very calm. He doesn't seem that upset that his girlfriend has been taken, and the things he's saying um, seems you know bizarre to say the least. And even the nine one one dispatcher seems um, you know like she doesn't really believe what he's saying, and and she doesn't seem you know so. Um, you know, uh, she's not making an effort to, to make him feel like she has um, any empathy in the call. That's for sure. So I want to know when was this case first brought to the public's attention? When were you starting to hear rumblings of it? When did you start to report on it and, and explain to people what your job was at the time? Yeah, I was a reporter at the San Francisco Chronicle and I had the early morning shift started at home and I was probably the first reporter to 
put a story online saying, hey, last night, a woman named Denise Huskins, here's her picture. She was kidnapped. The police are looking for her. They don't know where she is. And so I think from there, it caught the attention of the kidnapper or kidnappers because uh, they realized, hey, I'm awake. I'm online. And they said, you know, let's let's keep this guy in mind. So uh, yeah, I immediately jumped in the story and went to the first police news conference at Vallejo Police Headquarters that morning where the police said that this is a kidnapping. We don't know where she is or it was reported as a kidnapping and we just need to find her. Right. So um, when when did it become national news? Like at this moment, that second, that first day, was it just local? I think it was just local. Uh, but then later that day, if I recall correctly, as far as the timing, um, it really went haywire because uh, we reported that the Chronicle, essentially me, I got an email from someone purported purportedly being the kidnapper or kidnappers and had an audio file, what we call a proof of life, because on this audio file is a woman's voice and she's saying, I'm Denise Huskins, I was kidnapped. Other than that, I'm fine. Mm -hmm. And it goes on to say my first concert was Blink-182 and then she references a, a deadly plane crash in the Alps, which just really happened. So I think, okay, this has got to be a joke. I'm literally standing in the neighborhood of Aaron and Denise's house in Vallejo. I'm looking around thinking, okay, it's got to be some other reporter who's pranking me. Um, you know, why would I get a kidnap victim's uh, audio file? It sounds like her, but you, eventually we knew that we had to send it to the police. And from there, it probably skyrocketed uh, because it was her. It was her voice. It was later authenticated, although we didn't know it at the time, authenticated by Aaron, Denise's father, and others that this was her. So in the meantime, behind the scenes, did you know that police were um, interrogating Aaron at this point, basically had confirmation bias and believed that he was, um, he had done something to her, or may have killed her, whatever it was, but they were accusing him of a crime. We didn't have that uh, specifically out there that he was being interrogated. We did, did know that he was being questioned and that's natural, right? Anytime mm -hmm. a woman is kidnapped or may have fallen victim to foul play, Suspicion naturally falls on the boyfriend or the husband. And, you know, that's a logical step. We didn't know how illogical it later came to be. Right. Um, and it ended up being that he was being interrogated for about 18 hours. Um, and something that I came to find out while doing research on this story, that um, detectives, cops can lie to someone that they are interrogating to get a confession. Um, that seems incredible to me. Is that still legal is that a th explain that yeah that is legal here in the u.s uh, the cops can lie they can claim that they found blood or that they have an eyewitness or that you lie and lied and that a lie detector test shows that you lied all mm -hmm. of that happened essentially with aaron they said you know we we're not looking for a dead denise we're looking for uh, or rather we're not looking for an alive denise we're looking for a dead denise there's blood mm -hmm. in your house we know you did something and just to put the pressure on someone and in a in a real life scenario, if a person is truly guilty, that might pressure him or her into confessing it. And they can use that confession against them in a court of law. So it's so interesting because I feel like we've seen this in other cases. I mean, isn't this what like to catch a murderer was all about? We we see that there was that kind of coercion of, you know, making this poor young kid admit to something. Also, I have to tell you, I had a guy on my show recently, his name is Daniel Vallejas, and he was uh, in prison for 20 years. Finally, he was um, exonerated and he had given a confession um, under, you know, such, um, you know, pressure. And after being in there for 20 hours, he finally admitted he did it. He was a kid and spent his whole life trying to say he was innocent and finally was exonerated. But, you know, the saddest part of that on a side note was that to this day, he can't get his life back, even though it's been proven that he wasn't the murderer, that he was, uh, you know, the police basically did the same thing, had, um, you know, this bias towards him and, and blamed him from the beginning. And that kind of thing just seems like it should be illegal. It seems terrible that people can do that, especially to, um, you know, people who are stunned. They don't, you know, they're, they're going through their own trauma. And, and it is interesting to watch this documentary because they do show the footage of Aaron being questioned and his behavior 
seems suspect. It seems bizarre because if I was accused of something and I didn't do it, you would think that you would be pounding on the desk saying, no, I didn't do it. Have you looked at the stuff that's laying in my house? Have you, you know, they said they were going to call me, look at my phone. Like you would be yelling all these things, but I guess unless you're in that situation, you don't know. And also he was drugged and it seems odd to me. Did they even do a drug test to see if what he was saying was credible or not? Yeah. And we'll later find out that when we hear, uh, when I heard what turned out to be Denise's voice, she's also similarly calm. We didn't know at the time she had also been sedated. Right. And people react to trauma differently and that shouldn't be used against them. You know, what is the right way to react to being violently sexually assaulted and traumatized? There is no right way. People react differently. And of course, that's why, uh, you, you know, going to the psychology of it all, some people who are in a box in an interrogation room who have been questioned and coerced uh, for hours, they just say, okay, okay, I did it. They just want to get out of there. Right. They just want to say anything, anything, even if it means uh, confessing falsely to get those officers to stop what they're doing because it's so coercive. This episode is proudly brought to you by Lola V, an award-winning hair care line founded by the one and only Jennifer Aniston. She's been hair goals for as long as I can remember. I'm proud to say I get a lot of comments on my hair on social media as well. I feel like it's something I'm known for. And there are so many hair products on the market that can be confusing to other people if you haven't tried it yourself. But I found one that really works and finding something that's actually good for you is very hard. So that's where Lola V comes in. I put my hair through the ringer. I'm sure you do too coloring, styling, extensions that I get. I'm always changing it up. So it's crucial to have products that repair and shield my hair from future harm. If you want to get started, Lola V's bestsellers are the Cult Classic Glossing Detangler and Perfecting Leave-In Conditioner. They will be your saviors. They aren't just styling products. They're your hair's new best friends. And what kind of best friend would they be if they didn't give us a little treat? So for a limited time, you can get an exclusive 15% off your entire order at lolav.com. Just use code understood at checkout. So I got these products uh, maybe a week ago and I've been using them obviously every day. I absolutely love them. I've already reordered stock for myself and I've ordered it some friends that I knew had some things coming up that I just wanted to send them a little gift. Um, I can't tell you how much it has changed my hair already in a week. It looks and feels so much better. There's a tangible difference. The restorative shampoo conditioner intensive repair treatment makes every shower feel like you are at a spa. It's so luxurious, but it doesn't stop there. The post shower products will change your whole styling routine. I didn't really know about these things. I mean, I've seen different products before. I've always been nervous about my hair getting greasy, but the glossing detangler, the perfecting leave-in and the lightweight hair oil are an amazing trifecta of goodness. So unlock Jennifer Aniston's approved hair at lolav.com. As our loyal listeners, you will get an exclusive 15% off your entire order when you use code understood at checkout. That's 15% off your entire order at lolavie.com with promo code understood. Please note you can only use one promo code per order and discounts cannot be combined. After you purchase, they'll ask you where you heard about them. Please support our show and tell them that we sent you. Well, after the fact, I will say I I totally was impressed by Aaron as a, a guy, as a gentleman. I mean, he handled himself so well through this whole thing, did not blow up, did not flip out. Um, and that says a lot about a person, I think, because at the end of the day, he was um, proven to be innocent. Okay. So she, um, the police comes out, they say that they're, they're looking for someone, but eventually, um, you know, two, it was only two days later, right? Very quickly, all of a sudden there's a video and Denise is walking into her father's home. Unbelievably. Um, what I didn't understand about that video. And some people had some questions. She shows up, she's walking very slowly, calmly, but she has all these bags in her hand. It almost looked like she just came back from a trip. What was that about? Yeah, I don't know about what that was, except I'm not sure if she was, she had that bag with her when she was uh, kidnapped, you know, back in the trunk of the Camry. Uh, And I was a little concerned about who was that figure behind her in a sense. So a lot of, a lot of, um, but I think that was right. Some people said, wait, she just comes back from a camping trip. She's walking, she's calm. And what are the odds? You know, kidnappers, real kidnappers have been known to drop you off on the side of the road, on the side yeah. of the freeway, in the middle of the desert. Here she is. She explains later she's on, you know, in Huntington Beach in Orange County, 
door to door service from as her I mentioned, door to door service. What is this, an Uber kidnapper? You know, so it's really bizarre. I mean, right. of all the places on earth she shows up, it's her family's home. It's her home. It's where she grew up. And of course, the cops see that. Say, okay, that's made up. Come right. on. Right. And then what becomes more suspicious as she chooses not to speak to the cops, which later we realized was because she was being threatened by the people that had kidnapped her and she was worried about what would happen to her. But of course, they didn't sort of look into this further. And, uh, you know, I guess we then see a press conference with one of the police officers um, that basically says they Aaron and Denise owe us an apology for all the work that we put into this. And we're going to be investigating this further. And that's when people start coming out and saying this is a real life Gone Girl situation. So do you think if the Gone Girl movie had not come out that people would have been as suspicious about what was going on here? Yeah, that time in that movie could not have happened, you know, at a, a opportune time or inopportune time. Right. right. I think That's people sad. saw that. And you see, you'll see in the docuseries, the juxtaposition of the Ben Affleck movie with what really happened to Aaron and Denise. And you can't deny the eerie similarities. Yeah, I think the public consciousness was definitely raised because of that movie. A lot of people had seen it. You know, Gone Girl was bandied about. And of course, that led to. The actual kidnapper emailing me in, in an increasingly bizarre set of emails, manifestos, if you will, where guess what? He admits that they, when they use the royal we, they kidnapped Denise. She is to be believed. This really happened. They're confessing that a crime occurred, and you got to believe Denise. So I mean, what, what are the odds that a bad guy will essentially say, I did it, right? You know, and the cops are wrong? Right. So what did you think when you continued to get these emails? I mean, you get this proof of life when she's missing. And then after she comes home, the police are still getting it wrong in the kidnapper's eyes. Right. So he keeps uh, writing you and saying, no, no, no. Let me tell you how it happened and ends up sending you photos. Right. And and giving you proof of what really um, took place. How, what did you think when you were getting us? I'm thinking th- this has either got to be a continuation of an elaborate prank or This guy or group is bonkers and strange. I've got, you know, weapons wrapped in duct tape and flashlights. I've got a picture of this room with the windows covered in trash bags. And, you know, I'm I'm getting these emails at all hours of the day on weekends. I'm with my family. You know, we began to fear for our safety because, you know, he's using psychological tactics and saying, you know, I bet we are gentlemen criminals. We've been doing all sorts of crimes all over Mare Island, which is where the couple live. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, talking about drones, break-ins, it's just it's like it was no mistaking that this was really, really strange. And you know, we forwarded all those emails to Vallejo Police, never got any official response. I mean, I've talked informally to contacts there and say, you know, what is this? What's going on? And they didn't seem to know either. Right. So how up until this point were you reporting this story? I mean, you're supposed to believe as a as a crime reporter, I think you're supposed to believe the information the police is giving to you. So how in what kind of narrative were you reporting the story now? Yeah, well, we've been reporting along with my colleagues, you know, every step of the way, the the ups and downs, the roller coaster nature. But again, when that lieutenant branded the, this couple as liars and that went all over the nation, you know, we had to say what they say. We can't say, okay, well, they say they're liars, but we think that's not the case. They seem to be the arbiters of the truth, right? Mm-hmm. They're the police. Mm-hmm. They should know. And so traditionally, police will report police said this, police said that, you know. Uh, and at that point, we... did you believe them? Were you like this? What I'm getting is a, is not true. It's a hoax. And the, the police have to know what they're talking about. Or, or in the back of your mind, were you like, no, 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 I got to get to the bottom of this. There was it was really difficult to get to the bottom of this independently because, you know, this manifesto talked about all these different things. And it was kind of like a side thing. The 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 thing is that now that Denise is released, we cannot go into car thefts, burglaries. We need to look into the actual kidnapping. And so mm-hmm. when the police said that uh, this was a hoax, you tended to believe their version of the truth you know at one point there was a lot of, what's interesting i remember this rachel i one of the a lot of the emails seemed uh written by clearly written by a very intelligent person and i i even thought this sounds like a lawyer 
and we knew that I think one of Denise's relatives was an attorney. So I thought maybe this is part of the hoax where the family draw suspicion away from Denise, mm -hmm. had a, had this lawyer write this manifesto. And now we know more about, uh, well, I don't want to spoil anything, but you know, we know a lot about what really happened in the background of what, of the guy. Right. So, okay. I, I'm just curious when you're getting these emails, are you responding at all? Are you trying to communicate with this, with this person? Absolutely. Every single, uh, you know, the audio file and the, each email, you know, I don't recall exactly, uh, you know, the email address was something like, you know, Denise Huskins kidnapper, uh, Aaron, I am not Aaron or I am Aaron or you know, it's just these bizarre, completely made up things. So, but diligently, I do my due diligence, hit reply each mm -hmm. time. Hey, let's talk about this. I want to get your side of the story. No response at all. Wow. Okay, so he 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 wanted to open the communication with you to get his facts out, but did not want to continue to talk, which, by the way, is also very smart on his behalf. Um, okay, so when she comes back, I think everyone thinks the case is closed. No one's looking for a kidnapper. How explain to people how this changes? And again, we're going to go into taking a page out of a movie. Did you see Unbelievable? It reminds me of the story of unbelievable where, you know, a, a rape happens in one town. No one believes her. The police um, accuse her of lying. And then it gets solved by a police department in a completely other town that happens to um, circle back and, and proves her innocence. So explain to people what ends up happening on a side note. There is a woman who just started working in the police department and she ends up solving this crime. Can you talk about that a little bit? Right. So just like in Unbelievable, it, there was a yet another home invasion in Dublin, which is uh, in the East Bay of California, east of Oakland. And uh, just like what happened in Vallejo to Aaron and Denise, the invader shine a laser type light, you know, in the middle of the night. It's dark. It's the middle of the night. And um, but for him, gets into a fight with the father. <clears throat> and this was a situation that uh, the Dublin police knew was very serious. They eventually found that the intruder had left his cell phone there, and that was tracked to uh, Matthew Muller mm -hmm. in South Lake Tahoe. And the Dublin police are the ones who actually raid this home, How, you know, all the way in South Lake Tahoe, which is, you know, the vacation area. And they arrest Matthew Muller, and it was the dogged. Uh, work of the Dublin police <clears throat> that solved this case because they realized they found goggles with a single blonde hair in it. And they knew that um, the victim in Dublin didn't have blonde hair. So they had to dig in and they realized that Matthew Muller had been suspected of other similar invasions along the peninsula and in the South Bay of, of the Bay area. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I recall from watching this on um, the documentary. And I wonder if this was, you know, kind of made for TV or if this was real that um, this woman ends up, uh, what is her name? It's Misty Caruso, right? She, she ends up calling the Vallejo police and, you know, numerous times can't get anyone to answer the phone. And finally, when she gets them on the phone, she says, you know, she explains what's going on and she thinks, oh my God, we're going to solve this case. This is amazing. And they really don't care. They're like, this case is closed. Again, the Vallejo police wants nothing to do with it, still believes their confirmation bias that this is a hoax. This is uh, completely made up. They're owed an apology. So she takes it to the FBI. Um, I want to get into the FBI for a second. So a guy named Def David Sesma was uh, involved from the FBI. In the documentary, it, it alludes to the fact that he had had a relationship with the ex-fiance, I guess, of Aaron. And he did not sort of recuse himself from this um, what talk about that? Cause so many people have questions about that. Why was he still involved in the case? What was his, his involvement? And then kind of going down the rabbit hole of things I read and tell me if this is true, that the ex fiance, Andrea, um, was before, before Aaron was married and had an affair with David and then ends up, um, getting divorced, being with, with David Sesma from the FBI and then leaves him to be with Aaron. So you would think that David Sesma has some bad blood, bad feelings for Aaron because she ended up leaving, um, you know, ending that relationship and being with Aaron. What are your thoughts on all that? 
Yeah, I don't have the particulars of Andrea's background, but <clears throat> excuse me, what are the odds? What are the odds that an FBI agent involved in this case had been romantically linked to Aaron's ex fiance I mean, jaws dropped. Are you see that? Like, what? You know, what gives? What, I mean, what's, what? How small is this world? But right. uh, we we later learned that the attorney representing um, Denise, you know, wrote a letter to the Inspector General of the FBI saying, "Hey, this is." completely uh unequivocally a conflict of interest but uh they were rebuffed you know they were said no we want to see any issues at all so that continued on and, and keep in mind after denise reappeared alive not a murder victim but an accused hoaxer all the investigative details and the uh tenor of the investigation as you know was out to prove that denise and aaron made it up and they were probably preparing a case of making false statements to the fbi and so that's why the fbi took over Vallejo police, you know, washing their hands of it. And when the Dublin sergeant or detective, that's why she got a a brick wall. So it, it's just un unbelievable how the FBI helped crack the case, in a sense, forward it to the U.S. attorney and federal prosecutors. Yet this strange connection, you know, you had a lot of people wondering, well, David Sessman must have some connection to Matthew Muller, the suspect. But it, we don't think so. But, it, you know, a, a lot of the unknowns are still out there. Right. Um, since Andrea was supposed to be the original victim, um, we didn't talk about that, but w when um, the, the kidnapper came in, he, he had mentioned that he was there for Andrea, but he would take Denise anyway. Um, I'm curious, he did seem to know all his victims' names ahead of time. It seems like he had done recon on the house or his victim. Um, you know, was she, before we get into him, but was Andrea ever investigated? Has anyone ever tried to talk to her about what she thinks her involvement was or why her name was brought up? I would imagine so. I mean, my jaw dropped when I saw this documentary and I saw the footage of uh, Andrea being interrogated. That was the first time I'd ever seen that. In fact, a oh, lot wow. of uh, yeah, hats off to the uh, documentary producers for bringing us the never seen before audio and video of key interrogations and interviews. But uh, you would hope that she was looked at. But again, whether or not she's involved, clearly the feds and the U.S. attorney believe that Matthew Mueller acted alone. Right. Which, again, so many questions about that, because both Denise and Aaron consistently say throughout the the first night when they were kidnapped and then Denise, when she was being held, said that there was more than one. Obviously, it it was clear that Matthew was the one that was with her most of the time, but they they have always maintained that there were others. Has there has anything ever come out of that? Has Matthew ever admitted there were others? He's never he's never said anything either way. And of course, you know, one could wonder: is it true that let's say the blow up doll that they found, or recordings that I've heard included, uh, or they found some recordings of people whispering to make it look as if it's a group or, you know, did sure. he plant the blow up doll here and move it around? And, you know, Denise and Aaron said that they heard people, more than one person, you know, walking and, and moving things around in the kitchen. So it, that that's unclear. But, uh, you know, we, we do know that in the other cases in Dublin and the uncharged cases in Palo Alto and Mountain View, it seemed to be a lone suspect. So whether or not he was trying to, you know, make it all up. And and again, the emails that I got, they also, yeah, we are a group of gentlemen and criminals. We, 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 uh, we know that a lot of disturbed folks use the royal we to try to make it look like they're a bigger organization. Right, sure. Okay, so let's talk about Matthew Muller for a minute. He ends up admitting in 2016, um, he, he uh, pled guilty um, to kidnapping for ransom. So he said he did it. Um, Let's talk about him. His background is so interesting. He is a Harvard grad. He is a he he was a lawyer. He was in the military. Um, when I've seen him talk with you in an interview that you did when he was in prison, if you didn't know what was going on, you would think that that was a lawyer for the person he was representing. He was so well spoken, um, reminded me of Ted Bundy, good looking guy that clearly um, you know has some empathy, has some you know thought process behind things. I was astonished that this was the person that it turned out to be and and goes to show you that you don't know what, um, you know, someone who is a, a sociopath or a psychopath looks like. Yeah, you can never judge a book by its cover. And we see we can see uh, in the documentary docuseries that Denise 
also heard a clip of Mueller talking, interviewed on TV uh, in a TV news clip, immediately you realize that that is him because of his right. cadence, the way he spoke. And again, he, he worked in San Francisco as an attorney and naturally knew that the Chronicle is a good conduit for information, however one-sided. And, right. it, and it, made, it made sense because a lot of the manifestos seem to be written in such a way that this is pretty organized. It seems like a lawyer would write it. And he's a lawyer trained, a trained lawyer, although disbarred. Right. Um, so I wanted to clear up something. So um, he pled guilty, but then later on, you were having a conversation with him um, in jail and he was going in for another trial. So I assume that was the state trial. He had been, uh, he pled guilty in the federal trial. And then he, you were talking about how he was getting ready to cross-examine Denise. First of all, I did mean, that ever happen? Yeah, well, I mean, it just the sheer audacity of him threatening, in a sense, implicitly saying, I'm going to be cross-examining the sexual assault and rape victim. That obviously dropped more jaws, but ultimately he did not. He said, okay, I'm not going to do that, and you know, took a deal, and then it was also sentenced separately in state court for rape. Keep in mind, that federal case, there was no rape allegation. It was just the kidnapping. Got it. Okay. So he got 31 years or 40 years. What there there's different reports. What did he ultimately get? Yeah, if I recall correctly, he got like four and I I'm a little uh <clears throat> hazy. He did get decades in prison for the rape in federal court. And then I believe it's concurrent, <clears throat> excuse me, 31 years or so for rape in Solano County Superior Court. He's not getting out. Right. What what really struck me is that he did show some empathy to some of these victims. There was a victim that we heard about in the documentary where he was about to rape her. He says he's going to rape her and she gives all sorts of excuses of why that would ruin her life. And he, he stops, he says, you know what? I don't want to put you through that. And he leaves also in, when he's speaking to you, I found that he, you know, exhibited those feelings again, saying, well, if I do cross-examine Denise, I don't want to put her through this again. I'm not going to ask her some of these questions that would be obvious that we would all think he would ask her. And he's like, I, I'm not going to get into that with her. What were your thoughts about that? Yeah, I mean, again, it's just clearly the the, the thoughts of a, a psychologically troubled Man, I mean, we, we learned that according to his defense attorney, that he has PTSD, you know, mental illness. And, you know, obviously, clearly that cannot be an excuse. You, there are lots of men, mentally ill or mentally challenged people, as we, we, we know, who are law abiding citizens. And he went far off the rails, completely sick, dehumanizing, horrific stuff to Denise and Aaron. Right. And he, he did use that sort of mentally uh, mentally unstable defense, even though he wasn't deemed mentally unfit, but at the same time, you know, what about the PTSD that Denise and Aaron had to go through, which I thought was totally bizarre. And clearly in speaking to him or listening to him, you can tell, um, that he, he is absolutely fit. He was a fit to stand trial. Um, was he, I'm just curious because he is, he seems like such a, a sociopath. He would be excited almost to do an interview with you, to meet you in person, to feel like he could answer some of your questions. Did he represent himself in that way? Did he act like he knew who you were? Yeah. And, you know, and, but he was still obviously kind of beating around the bush. I would say, so you sent me these emails, right? If I recall, he wouldn't, you know, he, at the lawyer that he was, or he's trained, you know, he's, he knows not to necessarily trap himself. So he's, he could, he was dodging a lot of the questions, but he was very intelligent, very smart. And that's the scary part, you know, when we are dealing with a sociopath. Right. So, oh, another thing he brought up to you is that he had gotten married to the woman he was dating when all this happened in prison. Do you know, have you followed that story at all? Is she still with him? Has anyone tried to interview her? Yeah. I don't know her status. I do seem to recall reaching out to her perhaps in the court gallery, one of the hearings, and I, I, she did not want to comment. Got it. Okay. Totally bizarre that a woman would decide to marry him after the fact. Um, okay. So there's a theory that Denise and Aaron discussed at CrimeCon, um, that since the original victim was supposed to be Andrea, that it was actually her ex-boyfriend, the cop that was behind hiring Matthew Muller, that he was trying to scare Andrea so she would come back to him. And she ended up marrying this cop and having a child with him. Have you heard that theory? I've, well, I alluded to that earlier that, hey, could 
the FBI agent put Matthew Mueller up to this. No evidence of that, but you know, stranger things have already happened in this case and others. But as far as whether or not, I don't know the status of the personal life of Andrea and or the, that agent. So in the end, I think it's very evident that we viewers all believe that the Vallejo PD really screwed this one up. Um, as someone who was involved in the case personally, because you were brought into it, but as someone who was covering this, what are your thoughts on how Vallejo PD handled this? Clearly, they were presented with a bizarre series of facts, and I can see how they went down the rabbit hole and assumed that Aaron was guilty, that killed Denise, and mm -hmm. later made it all up when she appeared. Mm -hmm. uh, I can say that after another woman was kidnapped, after Denise was released, maybe a month or a year or so later, uh, th their press release on that case was so detailed. It, it made clear that they believed the victim mm -hmm. and that she was actually kidnapped. And so I, I would hope that there's been uh, lessons learned by Vallejo police and others and that people who see the doctor series uh, will realize, you know, law enforcement needs to step up. I have seen I've gotten many, 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 many comments and thoughts and responses from law enforcement contacts, former and current. They're saying, you know, I can't believe this happened. This is ridiculous. They did the wrong thing. You never brand, you know, victims a liar like that. And so I think this will be a big learning experience for law enforcement uh, around the world. Well, what's crazy after the fact is that I call him Colonel Mustard. What is it? Detective Mustard. He he right. was he was promoted after the fact and became like chief of police or something crazy. Right. No, he, he was promoted. Uh, he got officer of the year, Rachel, yeah. for that year, 2015. And so. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, and and just to let you know, you know, uh, Misty, who is uh, who cracked the case by Dublin Police, recently promoted to lieutenant. So that is a a silver lining that she is getting the due diligence honors that she deserves. Good, good. Um, and also, it didn't seem like anything happened to David Sesma from the FBI. He still apparently is working and and didn't have a slap on the wrist for his involvement. Um, and not recusing himself as well, right? Yeah, I don't know his current status, nor the status of that other agent who we see in the documentary, uh, you know, belligerently accusing Aaron of lying. And, you know, I know you did this and you failed that lie detector test miserably. No idea, excuse me, no idea of the status, but um, at least Mueller is there. But I, again, a lot of lessons still yet to be learned, I'm sure. And for people that don't know this, um, you know, Vallejo police, did settle out of court uh, and give the couple $2.5 million, I believe, or give Denise $2.5 million. I, I also read that recently something else happened and they had to settle for another $5 million to a completely um, separate in a completely separate case, which makes me wonder if anyone is going to start looking into the Vallejo PD and, um, you know, ask some bigger questions there. Um, and to see if, anyone would even issue an apology. I mean, to, still to this day, it doesn't sound like they've taken any responsibility. Well, the former police chief, police chief at the time uh, kind of had a, a written, um, you know, around the corner uh, letter that that apologized in a sense, but the the couple and their attorneys said that's not enough. It needs to be a public apology, not a private letter. Yeah. And the, the next police chief who succeeded that police chief apologize but he's no longer there and obviously he was never there at the time of the case so you know, there's a lot of a lot of uh, turnover and churn so whether or not there's any institutional change and improvement remains to be seen right okay so i'm just curious while this was happening what did you think i mean i know you've said you believe the police but inside did you have a thought one way or the other about what was really happening you know i was just by but in the middle of it, I was all just confused by, you know, the, the police saying one thing, the couple saying another, the defense attorneys, and I, uh, uh, you know, adamantly standing up for their clients. You know, we know that attorneys will speak up for their clients. We know that the police have branded them as a liar. I mean, I I don't think I knew what to believe. And getting all these emails, I'm thinking, is this a hoax? Is it real? Is that woman's voice real? It was just so, it's like almost like a one-off, you would think, mm -hmm. because you can't replicate this kind of bizarre set of facts. And this is, you can't say, okay, this is going to happen again. Now I know I have a playbook of 
what to do when this happens again, because it may never, ever happen again in our right. lifetime. I doubt it ever will because of the circumstance. Right. So that's my next question. I was going to ask, how has this changed how you report a story? You're still a journalist. Um, you know, what have you changed in how you report um, or the angle that you report from? Well, I've always tried to be well-rounded in a, a crime story where you know, for years, I mean, I've been in, in the business for uh, a, a while, even before this case, you you know that you talk to the police, you talk to witnesses, family members of suspects, family members of uh, victims. Mm -hmm. You get a whole complete rounded story so that you're not just parroting or, uh, you know, going by any one set of facts so but in this case you know that you can't take anything that police say necessarily with a grain of salt because they may have things hor horribly wrong at 180 degrees from what there is so that's why it, you know luckily we have a checks and balances system in court where the public defender or a private uh defense attorney will kind of rebut the government narrative say no you might think this but that's confirmation bias you have tunnel vision guess what here's the real suspect and uh, we'll show you why. So we are thankful that there's this balancing out process in court. And I'm curious, what do you think the police really thought from the beginning? I mean, do you think they were doing, they believed in what they were doing and they were going forward with that? Do you believe that they noticed that this couple, uh, you know, that Andrea had been dating a cop and an FBI agent, and, you know, so they automatically didn't like Aaron. Do you think that once they saw it was, you know, not going the right way that they just stuck with it because they were embarrassed of how it was going to turn out? Like, what do you think they really thought? No, I think they really thought this was all made up. And so I think everyone was stunned when the Dublin police uncovered all that material from South Bay Tahoe that matched a lot of the evidence from the Vallejo case. So they they had no idea what was going on. They were convinced that Denise and Aaron had made it all up. This was a gone girl situation. I, I think that they really had their blinders on, refused to realize that this actually happened. It's just so crazy to me that you would think after all this time or seeing that evidence that Detective uh, Muller wouldn't have later on after the fact spoken to Aaron and Denise and apologize. I mean, even just recently, you see that the case may be reopened with Scott Peterson. Some new evidence has come out and the, uh, you know, one of the police guys working on it said, if this, if we miss this, this is on us, you know, we're going to look into this. So I thought that was, you know, everyone has thought Scott Peterson is guilty up until now, you know, and now this new evidence might say that the police um, you know, messed up. I'm curious. I know there have been a couple other cases similar to this um, in the last couple of years. Um, I don't have the girl's name, but I remember there was a woman, I think it was also in California. Um, she disappeared from her home and showed up later all beat up on the side of the road. Like you would think, you know, that you would be left that way. Um, and her husband was desperately looking for her and it ends up, she was not kidnapped that she did this all herself and she went um, with her ex-boyfriend or something. Do you remember that story? Yeah, and I believe her name was Sherry Papini. I, I also covered that case remotely from the Bay Area. And that is another story where, you know, there are people who do make things up, but there are people who don't. And so each case has to be evaluated on their own merits. You cannot assume that because A happened, that your B situation is A. It could be C. It could be Z. Right. Right. So wait, did that case happen after the Denise case, Denise Hutchins case? Oh boy, gosh, now you got me. I'll, I'll run the well, same time. the reason what, what I'm asking is, did, did had you already gone through this and you knew, oh my God, is this happening again? Um, could it be real? Yeah, I, I just can't tell you the time. I can look it up on my phone, but I, I, it's just a situation where you think, you know, this is not helping matters for other women, victims of sexual assault, and mm. violence and rape um but that's one person and you can't ascribe the behavior of one person to others that's that's what we've learned from this case right and then there was the other woman more recently um that so said she saw a baby on the side of the road and then disappeared for two days and everyone in her family and her boyfriend were you know saying this is real please look for her we're so worried and then she came home and they still said this is real you know she's been through so much and then later we find out she apologizes and she made the whole thing up and we've never heard anything since
but you know, there are stories like this, which is why people don't believe these things, um, even after the fact. And it's just crazy what people do for either attention or because they're mentally ill or whatever it is. Yeah. And it's, it's sad because as journalists, we don't want to necessarily alarm the public. Let's say there is a, a set of facts that we personally, or as an institution don't believe, let's say that, you know, gosh forbid, it's a sexual assault. You know, we don't, we mm. tend not to say in, in print or TV, she or a woman, we don't say a woman was sexually assaulted. We say police say a woman was sexually assaulted or, or a woman reported, you know, these kind of phrases that might signal to some people, hey, we may not necessarily believe her, but it would be irresponsible if we were to say, you know, this happened to a 14-year-old girl when later on we learn that she makes it up, but then you want to be empathetic if this really right. happens. So if there's a lot of hand-wringing that has gone on with this case and others. What do we say? How do we present it? And often the, the thing that protects the media per se is if the police say it, it must have happened, or there's a preponderance of evidence that it must have happened. Let's say that they say this, and that's right. what got in all this trouble. Right. And and you're talking about evidence, which is what I also want to ask about, because so many people are are so confused. There was so much evidence left at Aaron's house, which they overlooked. There was the cell phone that he said he was going to get a phone call on, which they put on airplane mode. There was these emails you got that nobody seemed to check where the IP address was from or how come they didn't trace it to someone else. Right. I mean, there was a huge amount of evidence that was just completely overlooked. And like you're saying, when a a uh, police officer or someone comes out, a lieutenant comes out and makes a statement. You think in these press conferences, you're getting the facts up to that moment um, that we can go on. And then from there, you know, we wait for another press conference um, because everything else is just hearsay, right? Yeah. And, and I'm glad you brought up that, that it's a cell phone. People will ask me, well, why in Tar Nation did the Blaho police put that phone on airplane mode? Now, I've been told informally that that is a standard practice where they put it on airplane mode so that no evidence can be deleted or removed or altered. But guess what? You've just, you know, I can, I understand that you want to freeze that phone, but guess right. what? You can't just freeze it. You got to investigate it. So in, in, in putting an airplane mode, we know that that blocked the, the incoming calls. So it's, yeah, it's just a comedy of so many unfortunate errors that result in this harm. It's unbelievable. So after watching the Netflix, did you get a, a, a pre-screening of it or did you watch it like us on Netflix? No, I I don't think I didn't ask for any pre-screen. I saw it the, the first day uh, started to see it the first day it came out. And uh, yeah, it, it's been a, a storm. Uh, it's been, It's gone viral. And what was it like for you watching it play out in the three part series? Yeah, it's surreal to see, you know, I, I asked the, for the producers, am I, you know, in one of the episodes, hey, you're in all three. I mean, almost like the narrator. And so, but highly emotional. I, I cried. I'm not ashamed to say I cried seeing the reaction, the, the what Misty uh, reacted to all this, that she wanted to reach through, that she said, I got you, you know, and seeing Denise so strong and, and yet, vulnerable and all the harm that happened it was just ah uh, it just got to be ended but i'm was happy we'll see at the end uh, a nice a nice resolution as far as their family is concerned right and what was the process for you of getting involved with this why did you choose to do it i mean i think obviously they had a lot of credibility these guys they had done the tinder swindler before which was a big hit um and you know were you nervous um getting involved with kind of helping to narrate this even though you didn't know that was your role yeah, I know. I even when I was at the Chronicle for years, being back to the Scott Peterson case, I had been asked many, many times over the years to comment uh, on various programs and documentaries about true crime stories that I've covered. So I've done that in the past. I just want didn't want to, you know, pour any salt in the wound. So I made clear, hey, you know what? Obviously and rightly so, Denise and Aaron are upset at the media's involvement, and uh, they said they understood, but they thought it was very important to. Uh, talk about my involvement in the case and I think it came out okay as far as you know hey we regret all the circumstances that that happened here and hopefully there is some learning that has that has been done you were such a big part of the story have you ever um you know it seems like Misty was invited to their wedding were, have you ever reached out to um Denise and Aaron or even after the the documentary came out or what's your relationship like with them I haven't reached out to them at all uh 
want to leave them their private time. I have been in the same courtroom as them in Sacramento and in Vallejo. And, you know, we just leave it at that. I'm doing my job. Um, you know, they've gone through hell and back. So I've left them alone, have not per se asked them for interviews since then. I think it's pretty amazing that they ended up getting married and having children. I mean, obviously yeah, a, a circumstance like this brings people together, but could not be more happy for them. And, and just a shout out to uh, the, the filmmakers and documentary makers and the, you know, cinematographer, Stefan. But we see, you know, I don't want to ruin it, but you see what turned out to be Denise. She's at the beach, right? You, all you see is the back of her head. And it's a foreboding. It's like, what's going on? And then the same woman, you know, she turns and there's her family. Yeah. First one kid and then Aaron and the second daughter. It's just heartwarming to see that they're they're moving on as best as they can. Absolutely. Um, are there any other stories that you covered in the past that you don't think, um, you know, there's a real ending to yet? Well, certainly there's so many. Yeah. I mean, there's, I wrote a book about another true crime case. Uh, you wonder, I mean, this is a case of an Oakland computer programmer who uh, murdered the mother of his two kids. And so those two kids are without a mother. They're without a father who's in prison. You know, they're back in their homeland of Russia, and you wonder, how are they doing? You know, do they recall all the turmoil that they went through? So you always wonder, you know, mm -hmm. what has happened to families of victims, of suspects, suspects themselves, police? So mm -hmm. is that open ended thing because these cases never leave you. Right. Yeah. I recently had Susan Hendricks on, who used to be on CNN. I don't know if you remember her. She recently wrote a book called Down the Hill about one of the cases she followed, the um, Delphi case of the two girls who were um, murdered at the at the bottom of a hill. And she got so involved in the case. And the book was really great because it talked about how she covered it, but also, you know, no one ever talks about the families and what they're going through and how they deal with it after the fact. So it was a really interesting um, book. Is there a case you're covering now, or maybe you're not personally covering it, but you're, you're watching it because um, there's new information or it's something that is on your radar that um, you think is suspect that people will start to hear more about? Yeah, nothing comes out of my, but I will say that because of the advent of DNA technology and gen genetic genealogy, so, so many cold cases that many of us don't know about from decades past, cold case murders have been solved. We see mm -hmm. all the Golden State Killer case, which I covered. I mean, it's unbelievable how things that we thought were, you know, getting, gathering dust on the shelves, cases are now being solved years later because of things like genetic genealogy. That's where a lot of our focus has been on, you know, the old Stanford murders case, you know, you know, kids who were killed a long time ago, uh, now getting justice. But yeah. some of those killers have themselves died. So that is sometimes a little sad. But there are some people who are still alive today being hauled into prison on murder charges. They're 60, 70, 80 years old. Right. Um, I'm just curious. What about the latest news with Scott Peterson? Um, I know you said you used to cover that case. What are your thoughts on the new developments there? Yeah, it's 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 interesting that the L.A. Innocence Project has taken up the case because we've had everyone up to the state Supreme Court of California already rule. You know, although his death sentence was overturned, he's going to be facing life without parole. You know, we've heard all the evidence. But again, is there, in fact, merit to the fact that there was a burglary at the house across the street from Lacey and Scott? That remains to be seen. But, you know, there was never any evidence tying these guys to killing Lacey. And of course, we all know that Scott Peterson said he went fishing in the bay and that's where those the bodies washed up. So um, a lot of circumstantial evidence uh, points directly at Scott Peterson. But I don't want to sit, you know, we, here we are. We don't want to close the door. Our minds should be completely open. Everyone deserves their true day in court. And if this uh, is another bizarre set of circumstances that points to his innocence, we better listen and keep our eyes wide open. Right. Absolutely. Um, OK, where can people find you if they want to get a hold of your book that you wrote, that if they want to hear more from you, um, wh where are you right now? I'm on Twitter, Henry K. TVU. Um, Facebook is Henry K. Lee fan. Um, Instagram, I think I'm Henry Lee 4567, I believe. But uh, yeah, online email, uh, you can just Google me. I'm covering crimes all around the clock on my social media. So join in and take a look. American Nightmare is, 
I think number one on Netflix right now, congratulations. I think it's amazing your involvement in it and how well um, the docuseries is doing. Thank you so much for sitting with me. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you so much for listening to Misunderstood. I'm your host, Rachel Yucatel. Please be sure to subscribe to the show and give us a five-star rating and review. You can support the show by joining our Patreon at patreon.com slash misunderstood with Rachel Yucatel. Do you have ideas for the show or want to reach out? Email us at info misunderstood podcast at gmail.com. That's spelled M-I-S-S understood. Thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Misunderstood.